And when you pray. Not if you pray, but when you pray. And over in Matthew chapter 21, verse 13, Jesus said, My house shall be called a house of prayer. You know, I love to teach. I love to, the, I love to share knowledge with people about Jesus. I love the worship and the music. But you know, Jesus didn't say his house would be a house of praise. He didn't say it would be a house of teaching. He said it would be a house of prayer. And so I have had to learn to become more of a prayer because of that. And what I want to tell you this morning is bold prayers, bold prayers honor God, and God honors bold prayers. God isn't offended by your big dreams or your bold prayers. Have you ever thought, I don't know if I could pray that? That's that's pretty bold. You know, God might be having a bad day today. So I better not burden him, but I'll get him something little. No, God doesn't get offended by your bold prayers. God doesn't get offended by your bold dreams. You know, it says that his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And science has proved the heavens are like Jesus, or God's thoughts are like one, uh, is 1.6 billion light years higher than our thoughts. And you're thinking you're going to test God. I don't know, God, if you can answer this. I know rainy days and Mondays get me down. So I won't give you a big one on Monday. Hallelujah. No, his thoughts are that much bigger than our thoughts. So if you have a bold prayer, like maybe uh, Roger Milligan praying, God, heal me. That's a bold prayer. And you know what? God says, oh, that's too hard for me. Nope. And I've told you before, God heals us in many different ways. If you're reading your Bible, I can tell you at least seven different ways that God does heal. And you know what? If he chooses to use medicine, I'm okay with it. I just like to see people healed. See, in fact, God may be insulted by your prayers and my prayers if they're not impossible for us to do. My question I'd ask you is, why would you pray about something if you can already do it? See, God wants us to start praying about things we can't do. Because then we're bringing the God equation. You know, when the boys were down to the state tournament and I got to meet Jack, uh, I told him, I said, now we're going to see... Jack, if last year's state championship was because of the Jack factor or not, hallelujah. And so I saw Jack after the state tournament we won. I said, Jack, I hate to break your bubble, but the Jack factor wasn't what caused us to win state last year. But you know what? God is saying, you know what? Why don't you let Jesus be the Jesus factor in your life? Why don't you and I start believing God for something that's impossible for us to do, but not impossible for God to do? Over in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, it says, Now to him, this is talking about the Lord. Now to him, everybody say that to me, with me. Now to him, say it one more time. Now to him, we're talking about Jesus here. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above. Does that sound like God's going to have a problem with your bold prayer? No. All that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. You know what I found out as I get a little older in life? I just start praying bolder prayers. You know what? I have, I've been praying some really bold prayers for our communities, for our counties. You know? I don't know why we can't have a really, really nice youth facility center in Ponca that can be opened up to the kids around. You know that? Now, people might say, well, Jeff, that's too small of a town. No, I got a big enough God. Hallelujah. You know, I think, like I said, we don't serve a second citizen God. I tell you what, we are here up in front with the one God who has created the entire universe. Amen. I believe there is nothing God loves more than keeping his promises, answering prayers, performing miracles, and fulfilling dreams. You know why? Because that's who he is. You know, Meryl and I were just down in Springfield. We spent some time there. Thank God we came home. Okay, you know what I'm saying? You know, I love my grandkids, but at four, three, and two, man, they can make you tired quick, hallelujah, okay? But you know, I know as a father, don't you, our grandfather, don't you love fulfilling their dreams? You know what? God loves fulfilling our dreams. I don't know what circumstances you may be facing here this morning, but I'm confident that you are only one prayer. Say one prayer. 
I'm confident you're only one prayer away from a dream fulfilled, a promise kept, or a miracle performed. That's how I think how close we are. First, though, we must come to terms with this, who God is. See, God is for you. Turn to your neighbor and say, God's for you. Turn to your neighbor and say that. God's for you. Number one, if we're going to pray bold prayers, we need to realize that God is for us. See, if you and I don't believe God is for us, we will never pray that way. If we believe that, we know what's going to happen. We're always going to be praying small prayers. If we don't believe God is for us, we will never pray big prayers that are filled with faith. I tell you what, when I would go up to my father and ask him for something, you know, My dad gave me almost everything I wanted. He really did. And he gave me some things I didn't want, like a licking, hallelujah. You know what I'm saying? But the fact of the matter is, we need to realize our God is for us. He's saying, you know what? If you will come to me, I will take care of you. Amen? Over in Romans chapter 8, verse 31. Romans 8, 31. We need to realize that God is for us. What then shall we, what shall, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, Who can be against us? If you think God is for you, you're going to be pretty good at praying. If you think God is for you, you know what you're going to start thinking? You know what? I think you can do this. Amen? I've I've never forgot this story when my son, you know, when my son was in elementary school and I came home from the tennis match, I was coaching tennis, and I pulled up, to this day I still see it, and he was in fifth, sixth grade. And it was at night at, at the school, and there was a little kid pushing Nate. Pushing Nate, wanting to get in the fight. And the kid had his back to me. And he kept pushing Nate, and Nate didn't say a word. And I saw what was happening, and I just started walking up behind that kid. And all of a sudden, when Nate saw me, he didn't go back quite as far. You know, Nate was, he was backing up at first. And then this kid didn't see Daddy coming. And he kept pushing Nate and pushing Nate. And then all of a sudden, when this kid saw me, Nate, you can see it in his eyes. Nate thought, I think we can take him, Dad. Hallelujah. You know, (laughs) I think we can take him. See, you need to know your father, God, is for you. I don't care what's going on in your life. You can take him. Hallelujah. Because if God is for you, who can be against you? How we see God and how we pray will change the trajectory of our life. Prayers are like prophecies. They are the best predictors of our spiritual future. If you want to know what your spiritual future is, listen to what you're praying. It'll tell you where you're heading. Who you become is determined by a large part on how you pray. As we become people of prayer, we learn how to pray beyond ourselves, and we begin to claim God-given promises, pursue God-sized dreams, and seize God-ordained opportunities as we grow with Him. Prayer starts with discerning what God wants and what God's will is for your life. Until God's sovereign will becomes your sanctified wish, your prayer life will always be unplugged from the power of its supply. One of my favorite verses is found in Psalm 37, 4. Psalm 37, 4. It says, delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. I tell you what, that doesn't sound like a stingy father to me. God's saying, get to know me, and I'll give you the desires of your heart. You know why? Because as we spend time with our father, his desires become our desires. And he says, you know what? My desire for you is only good. And you know what? So he wants to give that desire to you. What is the goal? What is the goal of becoming and, and becoming a person of prayer? Getting what you want? No. See, I'm not asking you to start praying just so you can become selfish and get only what you want. The goal of becoming a person of prayer is to glorify God by praying the promises, the miracles, and the dreams He wants for you. My grandmother Annie, I love my grandmother Annie. She was such a prayer warrior. <laughs> God knows she had to be with me. She really did. I mean that. You know, I, I was talking to somebody the other day. I said, you know, these kids in Ponca and the surrounding area, and I think in Newcastle with, with Connor, even though I found out Connor was the biggest trash talker on the whole basketball team. Okay, you know, I was, but I thought he was the quiet one. You know what I'm saying? And Brandon and all these kids. These kids are so good. Do they need Jesus? Yes, like in all of us. But, but I can tell the parents have invested in their lives and taught them to be kind and courteous. 
These watchhorn boys, I hardly even know they're there. They're so kind. Is that how they all the time at home too, Robin? Oh, yeah, all the time. Yeah, especially now that they live in their big house again. Okay, hallelujah. Okay, you know what I'm saying? But God is telling us, you know what? We need to realize that what? That God has a plan and a purpose for us. And prayer helps us get there. You know why I'm where I'm at today? Because my grandmother prayed for me many years ago. Every miracle, get this, every miracle has a genealogy. What I mean by that? You can trace your physical manifestation to a genealogy of prayer. Somebody, a mom, a dad, an aunt, an uncle, a brother, a sister, a cousin, a grandpa, or grandma, somebody down the line has been praying for you. Every miracle has a genealogy, and that's where prayer comes in. Miracles are a byproduct of prayers that we were that were prayed for you and by you. See, I don't seek miracles. You know, I tell people many times, many times people miss the supernatural because they're looking for the spectacular. You know? I got news for us. You know what? If you're looking for the spectacular, you're going to miss the supernatural. Because you know what I think the supernatural is? I think the supernatural is when somebody is kind to somebody else. It says, be ye kind one to another. See, these are all acts, random acts of super kindness. And maybe it's not spectacular. But I tell you what, it's just as supernatural as all those other things. See, folks, when we pray, we live with a holy anticipation because you never know how or when or where God is going to answer those prayers. But one thing is for sure, God answers prayers. You know, I know Marilyn shared with the ladies when they had their party here in that snowstorm that a year ago, it's almost been, I think maybe within a week, was the first time I ever heard of Ponca and Christ the King. I remember I, I got on the, the web, I went to uh, churchstaffing.com, and I was going through churches, and it said, Christ the King Community Church, Ponca, Nebraska. It's the first time I ever heard of it. But before that, Meryl and I had drawn a circle, and we had put our prayer requests in that circle. And Meryl and I had been praying for months before, and I know people have been praying I've not, you know, that, that they're praying. Actually, they maybe didn't know it was us, but they were praying for us to get here. And you know what? So all these, these prayers came together. They just didn't start when it came together. They started out there. And we need to realize, maybe we don't see everything right away, but if we'll keep praying, it will come to fruition. And that's very, very important. See, folks, his answers, though, the Lord's answers are not limited only by our request. God has the ability to answer prayers we should have prayed, but lack the knowledge or even the ability to ask. I don't know about you, but I was not valedictorian. By the last, some of you weren't either. Okay, hallelujah. Some of you are just happy you're graduating, I bet, aren't you? Me too. So sometimes I don't even know what to ask. But if I'll just pour my heart out to the Lord, he knows what I have need of before I even ask. That's what prayer will do. Prayer shows God your heart. And that's very, very important. You know, you might say, how can this be? Because his power is greater than our weakness. Because his knowledge is greater than our ignorance. Because his future is greater than our present. That's how God does it. Our prayers have the potential to change the course of not only history, our families, but anything else that we will start to pray about. You know what? I tell people this all the time. I don't mix politics with with church much, but I am a firm believer. I'm a firm believer. The reason Donald Trump is the president of the United States is not because the Donald is so good. Don't tell him that. Hallelujah. Okay. Okay. He is the president of the United States because God wanted him to be. I believe that with all my heart. Now, some of you might say, he is a critter. He's done, he said some things that I don't agree with. But that doesn't mean God didn't place him here for this such a time as this. If you think you got to be just perfect to be used to God, check out the story of Samson. Samson was a critter. He loved to womanize and drink, hallelujah, and he never got a haircut. You know, that reminds me of a kid. 
you know, he was kind of like Hunter, had this long hair. His dad told him once, he said, you know what? His dad said, son, if you want a car, you got to get a haircut. Never got a haircut. Never got a haircut. Finally, one day, Hunter was reading his Bible. He came up to Kelly. He said, dad, you know, I read that Jesus had long hair. And Kelly turned to his son and said, yeah, and Jesus walked everywhere too, didn't he? Hallelujah. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) See, prayer changes things. Prayer. I believe God wanted Donald Trump to be president of the United States. And you know what? And you know what God said? How, what he does is between him and the Lord. It really is. Because, and you know what? I, I have some family members that would argue with me very vehemently about that. And I said, you know what? Our job is not to critique Donald. According to scripture, our job is to pray for him. Because God is going to judge me. Did I pray for my leaders? Not did I criticize my leaders. Does it mean I agree with everything they do? No, but you know what? There's one judge and I'm not him. Hallelujah. And so we need to realize prayer can change things. You know, and real quickly, I have your prayers. Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. Prayer changed the direction of an entire nation. It says in Daniel 6, 10, I, write, I wrote down. He, this is Daniel. He says, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since early days. What happened? Nebuchadnezzar made a decree. It said, you can't pray anymore to any other God but him. But Daniel continued to pray. Yes, Daniel got thrown into lion's den. But because God saved him, because Daniel decided to pray, Nebuchadnezzar, he turned his kingdom over towards God. See, prayer changed the kingdom. Number two, prayer delivered Peter from prison over in Acts chapter 12, verse 2. You know, it's kind of an interesting story in Acts chapter 12, verse 1. It says that Herod grabbed James and basically killed him. Uh, he, he actually skinned him alive. It tells us church history. They skinned him alive, James. And so it says that the plea, Herod saw that it pleased the Jewish elders, so he grabbed Peter and he was going to do the same for Pete. Okay, and and then what happened? It says in in James chapter uh, Acts chapter twelve verse two, Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. Well, you know what? The Bible does not tell us. I don't know if it's true or not, but the Bible does not tell us if the church prayed when James was taken. But it does tell us when Pete was taken, they prayed. Pete got out. Prayer was the difference maker. And, and number three, prayer caused a drought, and then prayer released the rains upon the land after three years, three and a half years. Look at what it says in James chapter 5. James chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. It says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. So what is it telling us right here? What was Elijah like? Seth. Okay? Yeah. Pretty impressive. Yeah, yeah. He was very humble, too, like Seth. Okay. Okay. <laughs> But what's it? You know, have you ever thought that the Bible characters seem bigger than life? Have you read about them? David, the king, was an adulterous person and a murderer. You guys are looking pretty good, hallelujah. You know what I'm saying? How about Abraham, the father of all nations, tried to pass his wife off as his half-sister so he wouldn't get killed twice? That's a man you'd like to stick up, have stick up for you. See, you know what? God just shows us the good, the bad, and the ugly. But he shows us the what? When we do make those mistakes, he's more than willing to forgive us. And then we keep on and we can be the person God's called us to be. And it says what? Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain in the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again and the heaven gave rain and the earth produced its fruit. Some people might say, you believe that? Yep. Yep. I guess Elijah was just lucky enough. He prayed once and it didn't rain for three and a half years. And he happened to pray again and it did rain. Man, he should pick the lottery, shouldn't he? See, what's the difference? Prayer. We need to be people of prayer. I love this. Jesus prayed for both you and I. Over in John 17, 20. John 17, these these are the words of Jesus. He was talking to his disciples there and he says, I do not pray for these alone. He's talking about his disciples there, but also for those who will believe. Do you believe? I do. See, he was praying for us who will believe in me through their word. Jesus Christ prayed specifically for you. I think that's pretty doggone good. 
Amen? Prayer. Number five, praying for someone will increase your power in prayer. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, uh, verse 20, it says, How could one chase a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight? They're talking about prayer. You know, I tell people, I don't know if this is an addition or a multiplication. But it says one can put a thousand, two can put ten thousand. I don't know if you gather people together, if you get to add nine to each time you get another person to pray, or you get to multiply it by 10. I don't know. All I know is when you get someone to come together and pray with you, it increases your capacity to pray and to get answers. We all need a prayer partner. And the last one I want to talk about this morning is there's when with unity with your spouse, it releases your prayers. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Now, it's funny. You might say, you know, some people think Peter was the first pope. I know that. And I don't, but if you subscribe to that, that I'm fine with that. But my only question is, then why did Peter have a wife? You might say, well, how do you know yet? If you remember, Jesus came in and healed Peter's mother-in-law. What do you have to be if you have a mother-in-law? I don't think guys are running around just grabbing mother-in-law just because they like them so much. I'll literally, okay? <laughs> You're, you got a mother-in-law. Sorry, except in your case, Dean. Okay, yeah, 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 right there. Okay, yeah. No wonder there's one between them. Hallelujah. Okay, you know. <laughs> no, I did that. But Peter had a wife. So what I'm, what I'm saying is, see, you know, he could write this, and he knew what he saw. He says, husbands likewise dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your what? That your prayers may not be hindered. Husbands and wives, when you guys come together and have unity, your prayers will not be hindered. So what is it really telling us? If with unity your prayers won't be hindered, what do you think happens if we have stress? Our prayers are hindered. Why should we, you know, and I love this too. It says, uh, dwell with them with understanding. I, I tell people all the time when I counsel them, premarital counseling, you know, they say, you know, I need to understand women. I said, good luck, hallelujah. Okay, you know what I'm saying? But I said, you don't have to understand women. The Bible says you just have to understand a woman. I don't know about the rest of you ladies. You're not my problem. The only one I have to understand is this one right here, and it gives me enough chores already, okay? So what God is saying, when we understand each other, when we get into unity, when we start praying, God says, you release more power in your prayers. Some of you say, oh, you know, you believe in that prayer stuff? You don't have to, and you can live the life the way you want to. I'm okay with that. I personally do. I personally do. And our God has answered so many prayers we don't even know yet until we get to heaven. I love what Dave Ramsey said. I'm quoting, he says, pray like it all depends on God and work like it all depends on you. See, prayer is not telling us that we just get to pray and then be lazy. Prayer is saying, you know what? We're going to do our best and let God do the rest. We're going to do what we can do and then God will do what he can do. And so, you know, I want you to stand up, if you would, please. I just want you to, I, I hope I can spark your interest. If you're already a person of prayer, that you just go further in. You know, and I'm not asking you, you know, to pray for an hour every day. You know, you know what, if I'm going to ask you to do that, we're going to be like the disciples in the Garden of, of Gethsemane, and they fell asleep, okay? But I'm going to ask you, would you just give Jesus maybe five minutes a day? Just five minutes. And you know what? You don't have to pray like anybody else. You don't have to pray like anybody else. You develop a relationship with Jesus, and you pray how you and him want it to go. And when you do that, your life, your spiritual life will grow, and I believe your physical life will take off. It really will. Jesus wants you to be blessed. Amen? Lord, I thank you and I praise you for this day. I pray, Lord God, that as we look to you, Lord, that we can just humble ourselves and, and ask you for help in situations. That, Lord God, we just bind away any fear, any pride, 
that thinks we don't need your help, Jesus. Lord, we do need your help in every day and every way. And Lord, I do pray for the people here this morning at Christ the King that you would just watch over them and bless them, give them safety this week, Lord God. Let their marriages, let their families, let their businesses prosper, Lord God, in a way that we know only comes for you, from you. In the precious name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Wow, what an amazing message. and Just what an amazing Sunday, right? Goodness, honoring our seniors. And, uh, you know, uh, I took so many notes, and I I type them in my phone, and and just all of those themes of bold prayers, our God is for us, glorifying God and praying the goals and dreams that he wants for you. But I'm going to ask you real quick, what's the word we always end our prayers with? Amen. So uh, I, I promise I was paying attention to your amazing message, but I, I Googled real quick on my phone at one point in it. I never knew in my life what amen meant. It's an utterance at the end of the prayer that says, so be it. And so those prayers and boldness and, and that we, you know, we do it every day. How many times do we say, amen, God? Amen. Well, that's not how we're going to say it today. We're going to finish with a song called All the People Said Amen. amen.